Hello everyone and welcome to today's second webinar in a three-part series, Looking Under the Hood and Getting Started with the Optima AUD. I'm Ross Verheul of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences and I'll be moderating today's live event. I'd like to thank LabRoots for presenting today's webinar, which is brought to you by Beckman Coulter Life Sciences, a global leader in centrifugation and life science instrumentation. Before we begin, I'd like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. I encourage you to participate by answering a few poll questions during the presentation and by submitting questions for our speaker at any time. To do so, simply type in the Ask a Question box and click Send. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, click on the Support tab found at the top right of the presentation window or report your problem by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the Continuing edu Education Credits tab located at the top right of the presentation window and follow the process to obtain your credits. With great pleasure, I now present today's speaker, my friend and colleague, Akash Bhattacharya of Beckman Coulter Life Sciences. Akash has extensive experience in various biophysical characterization methods, including analytical ultracentrifugation. He's currently a senior application scientist at Beckman with a focus on expanding and developing analytical ultracentrifugation applications. For Akash's complete bio, please visit the biography tab at the top of your screen. Akash, please go ahead and begin your presentation. Thank you, Ross, for that introduction. Good morning, everyone. I want to thank you for uh, attending our webinar. Now, the first webinar uh, of this three-part series, which we had uh, conducted earlier in June, went into the principles of analytical ultracentrifugation, where we really just described the technique to you and gave you a very brief overview of a few application areas. In this webinar, we are going to take a deeper dive into the technology of AUC itself, and then we'll be talking about the operational aspect of planning, setting up an experiment, and viewing the live data. Webinar number three, which will be in the first quarter of 2020, will go deeper into some other application areas as well. Okay, so let's get started. Before we do so, we have to show you a slide with various legal disclaimers on it. And now that you've seen it, let's move on. So our roadmap for today's uh, conversation is gonna be, uh, first we'll talk about the technical evolution of AUC, the technique. Then we'll give you an overview of the workflow of a typical biochemistry project and talk about interference detection versus absorbance detection. Uh, then we'll talk about the upgrades and advantages that the new generation Beckman Coulter Optima AUC brings to the table especially in comparison to the previous generation Proteome Lab Up uh, AUC instrument. After that, we'll move on to planning an experiment where we show you the use of simulation tools so that you can best design the parameters to, um, to get an experiment which is as informative as possible. And then we'll show you the operational aspect of actually setting up an experiment on your new Optima instrument. And then, of course, we'll summarize everything and give you some additional information about user group meetings uh, and so on and so forth. All right, so let's get started. So this is sort of a folk history of the technique of analytical ultracentrifugation. Now, in 1926, Theo Svetberg received the Nobel Prize in Chemistry for his study of colloids. The technique that he used was what we today call analytical ultracentrifugation or AUC. Now it's really interesting that while Svedberg received the Nobel Prize in 1926 in chemistry, uh, the same year, Jean Perrin also received the Nobel Prize in physics and his prize was awarded for the study of sedimentation equilibrium, which really forms the theoretical underpinning of the science of AUC. So I find it fascinating that in 1926, uh, the Swedish Academy chose to recognize both the theoretical as well as the experimental aspects of the syntactic technique that has been so strong and powerful through all these years. A few years later, in the late 1930s, Ole Lam wrote down a partial differential equation, it's really a transport equation, which described the movement of analytes inside a sector-shaped shell, um, sector-shaped cell. Uh, so 
I'm, I'm using this word sector shape. I'll show you in a few slides what that actually means. But this really forms the mathematical basis for the understanding of what happens during an AUC experiment. However, writing down this equation was only the start. It would be many years, in fact, decades, until the computational ability to solve this equation became available to us. The next major development occurred from the hardware and from the commercial hardware standpoint when Edward Pickel started a company called SPINCO, stood for Specialized Instruments Corporation. The acronym was very appropriate because he built centrifuges. And uh, he built the famous model E centrifuge, analytical ultra centrifuge, which I believe sold more than a thousand units worldwide and was a fundamental instrument in the progress of biophysics and biochemistry. So fundamental, in fact, that a few years after the acquisition uh, of SPINCO by Beckman in 1954, Messelson and Stahl conducted an experiment um, where they proved that the replication of DNA is semi-conservative. And this, is, this has fundamental implications in genetics. This experiment is, in fact, frequently described as the most elegant experiment conducted in all of experimental biology. And it was conducted using an analytical ultracentrifuge. The next major uh, development in this field occurred again in the late 1950s at Berkeley, I believe, when Schachmann devised the interferometric detection system. Now, the previous method of detection was uh, essentially absorption photography. Interferometric detection, which we will talk about in a little bit more technical detail shortly, uh, was a different type of uh, detection where um, anything which provided a refractive index difference between two sectors would actually lead to an image and thereafter lead to an actual peak. And it turned out to be an extraordinarily sensitive technique and allowed a lot of new areas uh, to be analyzed via AUC. Following these uh, hardware developments, the next major development in this field occurred in the late 1970s when Van Hold and team came up with what we today call the Van Hold Weichert graphical analysis. This is a fascinating technique because the solution of Ole Lam's partial differential equation is, in fact, a computationally very difficult and challenging task. Uh, the Van Hold Weichert graphical an analysis technique takes this very difficult computational problem and turns it into a graphical problem, which is uh, still very laborious to solve, but significantly more tractable, even with the very limited computational abilities um, available to most scientists in the late 1970s. Now, again, in the 1990s, uh, the the next phase of development swung back from analysis back to hardware, and this occurred with the release of the Proteome Lab Analytical Ultracentrifuge Instrument by Beckman Coulter. Now, this was a gigantic and dramatic improvement over the previous generation Model E. One of the reasons it was so is because the Model E, fantastic and flexible instrument though it was, did occupy the better part of a room. Its footprint was simply huge. The Proteum Lab, on the other hand, which many of you have actually seen and worked on, is something which is the size of a domestic uh, washing machine. Now, fast forward a few years again, and um, uh, in the late 1990s, another huge improvement in analysis occurred with the development of two software packages. One of them is called SetFit. This is developed by Peter Shook, who is at the NIH. The other is called Ultrascan. This is developed by Boris Demler, who is currently at the University of Lethbridge. Both of these software packages um, essentially provide numerical solutions to the LAM equation, and they are widely used in the user community. And this, uh, this really was the analysis um, milestone which the user community had been waiting for for perhaps half a century, ever since the original LAM equation was written down for software to become available, which would take advantage of the tremendous computing power which we see in today's personal computers to actually solve this fairly difficult computational problem. Fast forward again a few years, and in, 19, in 2016, Beckman Coulter released the brand new Optima Analytical Ultracentrifuge. And at the risk of using a somewhat cliched expression, this really is a quantum leap in improvement in the technology itself. Uh, 
for one thing, the detection methodology and the detectors have been dramatically upgraded. The user interface itself is now platform agnostic. I'll explain what that means in a few minutes, and is far, far simpler to use. And um, this has allowed this technique to now make inroads into a whole new um, plethora of application areas, but it really hadn't been used very effectively before. Some of those application areas include, for example, lentiviruses, uh, AAV capsids, um, fundamental in gene therapy, therapeutic uh, vesicles, therapeutic liposomes, nanoparticles, and many others. And um, this is actually a good point for me to pause and hand over control to my colleague, Roth, so that he can push out the first poll question, which is connected to application areas. Roth, over to you. Thanks, Akash. Uh, so our first question is to better understand our audience's background. So with that, for which primary application area are you here to learn about AUC? And we'll pause for just a moment. Okay, Akash, if you want to go ahead and please continue with the presentation. Thank you, Ross. Okay, so now that we've given you sort of a uh, folk history of AUC, let's uh, move on and talk about the workflow. So, uh, again, in the first webinar of this series, which incidentally is available in recorded form, and at the end of this webinar, you'll be shown the link to get to that. We talked about an introduction to AUC, and we discussed its overview capabilities and compared it to a few other biophysical techniques and gave you examples of that. Now, if you are getting started with a brand new biochemistry project, then you have some information before you get to the point where you want to do AUC. Specifically, you've probably run some Western blots. Uh, you've, uh, you've run some SBS pages, you've maybe done some size exclusion chromatography in order to get a pure uh, or as pure as possible recombinant protein ready. And now you want to do AUC. So before you do AUC, you're going to um, ask a few questions about experiment design. You're going to say, do I want to detect with absorbance or interference or both? Then if you're going to want to detect with absorbance, next question you'll ask yourself is, sure, I want to do absorbance. What wavelengths do I want to use? So now that you've got the first questions answered, then you would like to um, get some idea of what data you will eventually expect to see. So in order to do that, you would like to run some simulations in order to predict the sedimentation coefficient of the analyte of interest. So you've done some simulations, you've got these answers ready, which has given you the parameters that you want to use for the actual experiment setup. Now we come to the actual experiment setup. So for that, you're going to assemble cells. Once these cells are completely assembled, you're going to fill them up with sample. And once that's done, you will load the assembled and filled cells into a rotor, which is perfectly balanced. You'll stick the rotor on top of the spindle, close the lid, and then you'll walk back to your control laptop where you're going to program in a method which is specific and has the exact parameters that you chose from the simulation. You'll come back to the instrument, go to the touch screen, and then just hit go, and your experiment is off and running. Once the experiment is completed, uh, or once the experiment is ongoing, you'll go back to your control laptop, and you'll monitor the data as it comes in. And once the experiment is done, you'll download the data and analyze it via your favorite software package. Okay, so, uh, we did this, we, I did mention that there are two different detection techniques available on the Optima AUC, absorbance as well as interference. And uh, let's talk about the advantages and disadvantages of these two techniques. So absorbance, it's fairly easy to understand what the physics of this technique is. It's essentially UV absorbance as you have used in any UV spec in your lab, or perhaps an anograph. It works on the principle that you've got some photons coming through, and these photons are going to be obscured by the presence of analyte, and absorbance is calculated via the equation abs equals minus log I sample by I ref, where I sample is the intensity of uh, photons coming in through the sample. I ref is the intensity of light coming in through just buffer, and that gives you the absorbance. Now, 
The advantage with absorbance detection is that you can very specifically pick the wavelength of interest. So if you have a combination of different analytes and you know that you really want to see the behavior of one analyte inside this combination and you know that it absorbs say at 480 or 490 nanometers, you can park the detection wavelength exactly at 480 or 490 or whatever that was and observe the behavior of only this analyte. This selectivity is a tremendous advantage, especially in a crowded mixture of different things in your sample tree. Uh, how long does it take to detect? The Optima AUC is much faster than the previous generation instrument. However, you're still restricted to about a maximum of 20 seconds of scanning time per sector. Now, in comparison to this, the physics of interference detection is uh, very similar to the, uh, it, it's basically connected to the classic Young's double slit experiment, which every physics student has read about in a web, wave optics class. The idea there is that light passes through both the sample sector and the reference sector, and I'll show you what those things look like in just a moment. And if there is an optical path length difference between these two sectors, then you get what is known as a fringe pattern. And as the analyte sediments over the time course of an experiment, this fringe pattern moves. This movement of the fringe pattern is converted to an actual scan, which is what you're eventually going to end up processing um, offline. So anything which creates a optical path length difference is going to show up in the form of a fringe. This creation of an optical path length difference occurs because the refractive index in one sector is different from the refractive index in another. This allows the interferometric detector to actually be significantly more sensitive than the absorbance detector. However, this sensitivity comes at the cost of selectivity. In other words, if there's anything in the interferometric detector which creates a refractive index difference between the two sectors, that will show up as a fringe, and that fringe will eventually show up as a scan, and the scan will eventually show up as a spurious peak. So in other words, in order to get the very best quality data that you possibly can out of the interferometric detector, you really have to make sure that the buffer is matched as carefully as possible. In fact, perhaps even more carefully than you would match while doing an ITC experiment. If you do so, then you will not have this problem of spurious peaks, and you will have all of the advantages of the extraordinary sensitivity of this sector, but you will not be seeing any spurious peaks. Uh, the other advantage of the interferometric detector is that it's significantly faster. In fact, you can get down to perhaps as quick as um, five seconds per scan, I believe. So there are both advantages and disadvantages to both techniques, and whichever one you choose is really going to depend on what you want to do. And for example, if you wanted to record data on something which is very large, such as a virus capsid, and uh, you thought that it is something which is going to sediment very quickly in an experiment, you may want to go for interferometric detection simply because it is that much faster. Okay, which um, again brings us to uh, the second poll question where I'm going to hand over control to Ross where he can push this question out to you. Ross? All right, thanks again, Akash. Our second question is regarding the preferred detection methods of the audience in your primary workflows. So which detection methods are critical in your primary application area? And again, we'll give just a moment uh, to pause before we get back to the presentation. Okay, Akash, if you want to go ahead and continue on with the presentation. Thank you, Ross. Okay, let's move on. So now let's spend a moment looking at the advantages with uh, which the Optima AUC brings to the table, especially in comparison to the previous generation instruments. So first off, uh, the Optima AUC has significantly faster um, scan rates. In fact, um, at least three times faster than the previous generation instrument, and in practice, sometimes more depending on the rotor speed as well. Now, we come to the number of wavelengths. Uh, in the previous generation instrument, you really could just get only one reliable wavelength 
you could try to get a few more, but reliably speaking, you'd only end up just getting a single monochromatic detection. In the new generation instrument, this is no longer the case. You can, as a matter of fact, get up to 20 different wavelengths on the single expand. Now this multi-wavelength detection is exceptionally important, especially if you're dealing with complex systems such as proteins plus nucleic acid combinations. And it allows for the possibility of global fitting and obtaining biophysical parameters for which you would have to run perhaps five or six different experiments. But now you only run a single experiment with multi-wavelength detection. It is an amazing advantage which the Optima AUC has brought to the biophysics field. Uh, in terms of the precision of the wavelength, uh, in comparison to the previous instrument where the wavelength was guaranteed to 3 nanometers, now it's guaranteed to 0 0.5 nanometers. And in terms of radial resolution, where earlier you would get data sampled at 30 micron intervals on the radial axis, now you get data sampled at 10 micron intervals on the radial axis. In other words, you get three times as much data as before, and you still get it faster. In terms of the interferometric system, Earlier, you used to have only about four fringes per cell. Now you have greater than 10. In fact, the number is a little bit closer to 16 fringes per cell. That's a big advantage as well. And uh, in terms of the actual usability of the instrument, the previous generation instrument did not have a touch screen. It had a monochromatic small seven inch control screen. And it was connected to a fixed Windows version computer, uh, which you did not have a choice in upgrading as well. Now you have uh, the system controls via an onboard touchscreen, and it has its own uh, internal operating system. But all of the actual programming of a new method can occur offline, uh, I'm sorry, not offline, but not on the instrument, but via your own control laptop sitting in your office. That control laptop can be a Windows machine, it can be a Mac, it can be a Linux box. As long as you've got Chrome or Firefox, and you can connect via browser to the instrument, you can control the instrument. So that's what I meant when I said uh, the Optima AUC is essentially platform agnostic, and you won't ever have to worry about supporting an old and fixed version of Windows anymore. So with these advantages, we hope that the Optima AUC will bring a lot more convenience to your experiments and your science. And uh, in terms of actually doing an experiment, this is something which um, uh, the people who've worked on the older Proteum Lab instrument in particular are going to really, really appreciate. Putting the detector into place after you've uh, loaded the rotor on top of the spindle is as simple as turning these two knobs on the sides of the centrifuge bucket. When you do so, the pre-mounted uh, absorbents and interferometric detectors swing into position. You close the lid and that's it. You're good to go. You can start your experiment. Uh, let's take a brief look at the journey to go from sample to data. So if you've got an assembled cell, as shown in the top panel figure, and you use a thin stem pipette to load up sample into it, then you would stick the cell inside the rotor, make sure it's balanced, put the rotor on top of the spindle. What happens then? The rotor, when it's sitting on top of the spindle, is exposed to this optics arrangement, wherein a light source, as it happens, is xenon flash, uh, sends light via a number of fold mirrors up and down through the two windows and through the centerpiece, that is to say, through the cell and through the actual sample itself, and down below where it hits a detector. That detector happens to be a photomultiplier tube. All that does is that it takes this light, converts it into a voltage, and what you essentially get out is that number that I was talking about before, which is intensity counts. That intensity counts can thereafter be converted into an actual absorbance number. And you've also got this radial slit. It's the movement of this radial slit which gives you the data which is separated at 10 micron intervals. So really, the data that you're getting out of an AUC experiment ultimately comes down to on the y-axis, you expect to see some kind of absorbance number. And on the x-axis, you expect to see some kind of radial distance in centimeters. That is the figure which you're seeing on the bottom right panel. And when you do so, uh, you will want to know what does an actual data scan look like. And that is what we'll explain in a moment. So if you look at the top right panel, you will see that this is a schematic view of uh, looking vertically down upon the two sectors of an AUC cell. The left sector, which is shaded in white, is the reference sector. And all you've got there is just buffer and nothing else. 
The right sector, which has these two different colors, three different colors, red, cyan, and dark blue, is the sample sector, and let's explain what these three colors mean. So the first color, red, you've got nothing there. That's the air gap. In other words, there's no sample, there's no buffer, there's just air. Now, if you've got just air, you don't really expect any absorbance at all. Therefore, this region should have an absorbance of zero, and that is exactly what is shown in the uh, region marked air gap in the bottom right panel of the absorbance plot. Now, after the air gap, you have the cyan region. The cyan region corresponds to where you've got a buffer, but you do not have any actual analyte. Now, again, buffer, if it is properly matched up against the reference sector, should also have zero absorbance. So the buffer-only region, as shown in cyan in the absorbance plot, also has an absorbance value of zero units. However, the transition from the air gap to the buffer region occurs via the meniscus. Now, the meniscus is, for various reasons, a region of opacity in an absorbance experiment. So that is seen as a spike in the absorbance value as you transit from the air gap to the buffer. Now, what about the last region? The last region towards the bottom of the sector is shown in dark blue. This is the region where you've got sample. Now, once you've got sample over here, this sample is at a constant concentration because this is a velocity experiment we're talking about and not an equilibrium experiment. And uh, this constant concentration means that in the absorbance uh, plot, you should really see this as a flat plateau. And that's exactly what you see in the buffer plus analyte marked out region, where you've got an absorbance value of approximately 0.5. Now, here's the interesting thing. The transition between the buffer only region and the buffer plus analyte region is something which we call the boundary of this experiment. Now, if there was no diffusion of the buffer at all, this boundary would be nothing but a simple step function. However, in practical terms, there is always going to be some thermodynamic diffusion, and therefore this boundary has this beautiful S shape that you see in the absorbance plot. And as the experiment progresses, more and more analyte moves towards the bottom of the cell. Therefore, this boundary keeps moving towards the right of the cell, and it is the movement and the shape of this boundary which really contains all of the essential mathematics of AUC, which is then converted into the peak distributions that you typically see in a publication. So this, in a nutshell, is how you go from sample to data in an AUC experiment. Okay, moving on. I want to show you a actual real-life case study of um, the Optima AUC as compared to the previous Proteum Lab instrument. This is an example of data acquired on an adeno-associated virus or AAV sample, and uh, these two experiments on these two instruments were run using samples from the same freezer box from the same prep, which was just aliquoted out separately. So uh, the speed for this experiment was 18,500 RPM rotor speed for both instruments. Uh, as you can see, the Proteome Lab instrument essentially just give you, gives you maybe 12 useful scans before everything sediments because it's not very fast in acquisition. The Optima AUC instrument, which is the right panel, gives you three times as much data. In fact, it gives you about 35 or so useful scans before everything sediments. Now, this is just a raw data, but it's fairly obvious that you get three times as many scans as before in the new generation instruments. Now, when I went out and processed all of this, I also found out that the, uh, after processing, the actual RMSD of the Optima instrument is one third the RMSD of the older Proteum Lab instrument. So the new instrument, is, does not just give you faster data, it also gives you significantly cleaner data. This is, of course, very important if you're working in gene therapy where you're working with really large analytes and you want as many scans as possible for everything sediment. And that is uh, a good segue into moving into our next section where we talk about experimental simulations, the things you must do before you get started. So in this, I want to uh, get into simulations via two different case studies. What are these two cases? The first is a two-component antibody case study, where the first component, which provides 70% of the total signal in the system, is a 50 kilodalton fragment of an antibody. The remaining 30% of the signal comes from a, the 150 kilodalton full and complete antibody. This simulation was carried out using FedFit 16.2, the calculated toolkit. The second case study uh, concerns a three-component adeno-associated virus system. The three components are one-third 
empty capsids, one third capsids filled with half of the genome, partial genome load, and one third of the capsids filled with the complete genome. This simulation case study was carried out using UltraScan 3 for Windows, specifically the finite element calculator inside UltraScan. Okay, let's talk about simulation case one. You are interested in choosing the correct loader speed. So for the purposes of this simulation, I asked SetFit to generate 50 scans for me, which are separated at 300 second intervals. And I said, let's do it at several different loader speeds. So the first figure that you see on the top left is at, it's acquired at 20 kilo RPM. And all you see here is incomplete sedimentation as well as inadequate separation. As you increase the rotor speed to 25 kilo RPM, keeping all the other parameters the same, you see that the sedimentation is somewhat more complete, but it's really not there yet, and the separation is also inadequate. When you get all the way up to 40 kilo RPM, now you start seeing something very interesting. What you see is that uh, there are two plateaus. One of the plateaus, you, the eagle-eyed observer will also notice, occupies about 70% of the total signal height. The other plateau corresponds to about 30% of the so, um, total signal height and also appears to correspond to a slower moving species, although you cannot have to squint to see it. Now this is very interesting because it tells you, even via a direct visual inspection, that there are at least two distinct species in this data set, uh, even without processing it out it at all, this is something which you can figure out even looking at just the raw data. However, you can still tell that since um, this data hasn't completely sedimented yet, the experiment for all practical purposes is not yet complete. So separation is kind of adequate, but the sedimentation is incomplete. Now, if you jack the speed up to 50 kilo RPM, you see this amazing thing, where these two plateaus are beautifully, distinctly visible and separate. And all of the actual sample has sedimented, so any further scans that you're going to be acquiring are going to be essentially just baseline scans, and baseline scans are really just useless for you. So what you have here is perfect separation and complete sedimentation, and this I would count as a, a really well-designed experiment. We've acquired all of the data that you need, and you're not wasting experiment time on acquiring useless data beyond this. Uh, remember the following rule of thumb. Resolution always increases with rotor speed, and Experiment duration will determine whether the sample is fully sedimented, provided that the scan number and the scan time separation is something that is previously set up and fixed. Okay, let's look at the second case study. So over here, in a three component viral system, we want to balance speed scans as well as resolution. So what I did was um, I ran simulations on this three component system on an entire range of rotor speeds going from five kilo RPM all the way up to 50 kilo RPM. If you're restricting yourself to lowest uh, rotor speeds such as five kilo RPM, you get this trace on the right hand side plot, um, which is shown in red, but you barely see the main peak separated perhaps into two components. The separation is really bad. However, if you go all the way up to 40 kilo RPM, you see three completely clearly distinctly separated peaks and the separation is all the way down to the baseline. This is amazing. You started off with three, um, a three component system and you see three peaks which are separated all the way down to the baseline. So the question really is, what does the raw data look like? So if you look at the uh, left the bottom panel at 40 kilo RPM, you've got three distinct plateaus over there. The lowermost plateau corresponds to empty capsids the second plateau corresponds to halfway loaded capsids, and the third plateau corresponds to fully loaded capsids. So I really wanted to show you that even the visual inspection of raw data as shown in the left-hand side panel, it can actually be fairly informative um, with a little bit of experience because you know what you're eventually going to see once you fun fully process the data. It's a good sanity check, in other words. If you were to reduce the speed down to 19 kilo RPM and instead get a lot more scans instead, which you can of course do, then you really, really have to squint in order to um, answer the question how many plateaus are there. You cannot really say that the distinct plateaus are distinctly visible. So for AAV capsid samples, uh, I would actually suggest that you run at a minimum speed of 22 kilo RPM. In this case, it's probably okay to optimize for rotor speed and instead of scans. And um, of course, you'll be happy to know for all gene therapy customers that the Optima AUC scans at least three times faster than the previous generation proteome lab instrument. Okay, so uh, now that you've 
looked at how to use simulation tools in order to get the experiment parameters. And by experiment parameters, really what you need is how many scans do I want? What is the time separation I want in my scans? And what's the rotor speed I want? Now let's talk about how you actually set up an AUC experiment, the nitty gritty of operations. So you've got a choice of rotors. Um, on the left-hand side panel, this is what your actual Optima AUC instrument looks like. On the right side, you've got a picture of two different rotors. If you want the throughput um, advantage of an eight-hole rotor, then you can pick the eight-hole rotor. Unfortunately, you're restricted to a maximum speed of 50 kilo RPM. Now, this is usually completely just fine for almost all applications. However, if you're working specifically with small molecules and you really need that additional bit of separation which you can only get by pushing the speed up to 60 kilo RPM, then you should be working with the four-hole rotor which is rated to 60 kilo RPM. And we also do sell um, aluminum centerpieces which are also rated to 60 kilo RPM. So the advantage here is speed and the advantage for the eight-hole rotor is throughput. So about cell assembly and loading, this uh, sample itself is loaded inside these uh, centerpieces. Remember when I had said earlier in the talk uh, that ole lamps equation described the movement of an analyte inside a sector shape? This is what the sector shape looks like. It is called so because it quite literally is the sector of a circle. The sample is loaded inside this sector shape via the sample loading holes shown by the red colored arrow. The centerpiece, uh, before you actually load the sample, you're going to assemble the complete cell. The assembly of the cell occurs in the following fashion. You take the center piece and you bracket it via these two windows, top and bottom. You create a sandwich. The center piece is right in the middle. And everything is loaded inside of this aluminum housing. But you then put a gasket on top and then a screwing, tighten the screwing, and use this torque arrangement where you torque it up to 120 inch pounds and therefore make it completely leak proof. And then you go back and load the sample into the cell via these um, narrow stem pipette tips. Once the sample is loaded, you seal up the loading holes with a um, gasket and then a brass plug. And then you are ready to weigh the total cell, balance it against another cell, put it inside of the rotor, and once the rotor is completely filled up and balanced, you can put the rotor on top of the spindle. You turn the detectors into position by rotating these two knobs on the side of the centrifuge bucket. And then you push the armored lid closed. You hit the vacuum button, and you're good to go. You can start your experiment at that point. Now, you've loaded everything up. You've hit the vacuum button. Uh, but you want to program a brand new method. I mentioned a couple of words about the control of an Optima AUC. Now, the control works in the following fashion. As compared to the previous generation instrument, where you had to have a computer tied to the Proteum lab, usually sitting right next to it, and that computer operated on a very specific old version of Windows, which you then had to maintain. In this case, things are a lot simpler for you. Uh, this is because the programming of a new method, really the control of methods and scans, et cetera, et cetera, uh, is going to occur via what we'll call a control computer. This control computer can be a Mac, a PC, a Linux box, whatever you want to. And as long as it is within the allowed IP addresses recognized by the Optima instrument, and for the purposes of this, our service team is, will work with your IT department to get this set up. Um, the Optima AUC doesn't care what the control computer is. All it cares about is that the control occur via browser from that control laptop. Now, if you've got Chrome or Firefox in your laptop, you're good to go. So you just type in a IP address into the address bar of your browser, and you end up directly looking at the splash screen for the Optima AUC. On this splash screen, you have a number of buttons on the left-hand side. Going from system status, all that tells you is whether there's an experiment running. If so, at what speed? It monitors the temperature. It monitors the vacuum. The next button down is method scans, which we will use to program in a specific method or to just select an older method and uh, copy it and uh, give it a new name and run it. This is, of course, important if you're working inside a GMP environment. Uh, then you have the live data tab where you will look at the data as it's coming in, as it's been acquired on the instrument. And then the save data tab allows you to save and convert the data into a tarball and download it for offline analysis. And then, of course, you've got simple um, system settings and so on and so forth. 
Okay, so viewing the live data. Now, you can view live data from the absorbance module in both absorbance mode, which is what we are usually accustomed to viewing, or you may even want to view it in intensity mode, where what it gives you is the actual intensity counts, which is read off the photomultiplier tube arrangement. Now, if you look at just the absorbance scans, then you see a panel, as you will see on the top left side, and that is an example of a data set collected where all of the scans are being observed. But if you want to collect every 10th scan and space it out a little bit, then you have the bottom left panel picture, where again, it's absorbance data, but collected only every 10th scan. The corresponding intensity images for that particular sample factor are shown on the top right, and every 10th intensity scan is shown on the bottom right. And uh, you will note that this in, uh, in, in a sort of a very hand-waving mathematical way, it's kind of the inverse of the absorbance image. But of course, uh, the equation to convert it is not exactly an inverse. It's a logarithmic equation. But I find the intensity scan image to also be very informative, because sometimes you can debug things uh, fairly easily by looking at the intensity scan image. Now, there might be a situation where you have uh, a lot more sample inside the sample sector than you had originally anticipated. And if you do so, then the sample might effectively be really dark. And by dark, I mean that not a whole lot of photons are going through. And if that is the case, then the absorbance detector is going to be saturated. Now, this saturation occurs at about an absorbance value of, it's about three units. If that occurs, then this is what the absorbance data looks like on the top left side panel. If you see scans which look like this, um, your detector is saturated, and this experiment is really not going to work. If you look at the intensity data for a saturated detector, you see the top right side panel where everything is just flattened out at zero. And again, that tells you that not a whole lot of photons are coming through. This experiment is not going to be very useful. Now, you can do more than just look at the absorbance data. You can also look at the interference data. What does that look like? So I told you that the interference data, actually the raw data itself, is available to you in the form of fringes because it's connected to this uh, classic experiment called the Young's double slit experiment in wave optics. So you really do have the opportunity look, to look at the fringe images. And that is what is shown to you on the bottom right side. Now these fringe images are Fourier transformed and then they turn into actual scans which are shown to you on the bottom left side. So you have the opportunity to both look at the uh, interference scan data as well as the actual images. I frequently find it useful to look at the interference images because in some cases they can be very, very useful for troubleshooting um, various things in your experiment. Okay, now that you've seen the live data and your experiment is complete, you want to export the data. That's as simple as going into the saved data tab, picking off the experiment of interest, selecting which cell you want or selecting all of the cells, and then just hitting the export button, at which point, the uh, Optima AUC will convert all of that data into a star GZ file, which you can then download and use for offline analysis. It's worth mentioning two things over here. The previous generation instrument, the Proteome Lab, either recorded absorbance data for you or recorded intensity data for you. If you wanted both absorbance and intensity data files at the same time, that instrument did not have the option of giving that to you. In this case, the Optima AUC will give you both absorbance data files as well as intensity data files. And uh, in some cases, you may actually find it useful to go with the intensity data files because you can do pseudo, what is known as pseudo absorbance analysis with that and you can double the throughput. We'll talk about that in webinar number three. Uh, it's also worth noting that uh, the TAR GZIP arrangement will also generate a file which has all of the image files in it from the interferometric detector. Now this is interesting because you can look at those image files and like I said, diagnose things even offline by just by looking at those files. And since the image file tends to be pretty large, in fact it can easily exceed a gig, it's going to be a separate file. Okay, let's summarize everything we talked about. The Optima AUC is an amazing instrument which offers you multi-wavelength absorbance up to 20 different wavelengths as well as simultaneous interferometric detector detection. Um, the system control is via an onboard touchscreen, 
Method scans can be set up remotely using your laptop, which can have your preferred operating system and your preferred browser, as long as your preferred browser is either Chrome or Firefox. Uh, we don't make any guarantees with the Safari. You can copy previously loaded method scans or create a new one. Live data can be viewed remotely via the browser. You can look at absorbance scans, intensity scans, as well as interference uh, fringe images. You can compress and download the data for offline analysis using your favorite software. Now, I want to leave you with this experimental design rule of thumb. Higher rotor speed is always going to improve the resolution between different analytes. More scans in an experiment will improve the reproducibility of your data. Adding additional baseline scans once everything has pelleted is not really useful to you. So if you do have an experiment where you are acquiring a lot of baseline scans, it's worthwhile just tossing those scans when you go to analysis. Or you could just stop your experiment once, once the live data is tapped to show you that everything has pelleted because you're essentially done at that point. Okay, so I, I'm going to um, tell you what the third poll question is while Ross pushes it out. And the third poll question is the following. After attending this webinar, what additional information would you like to receive about analytical ultracentrifugation? If you have additional comments, you can write those comments in as well. And let's give you some uh, additional info before we uh, finish up. The recording for webinar number one, which was um, earlier in June, is available at this link shown. The third webinar is coming up in the first quarter of 2020, also on LabRoots. My colleague, Ross, who has been the moderator for this event, is going to deliver a webinar himself. His talk is going to be on optimizing density gradient preparative ultracentrifugation in the gene therapy context. This will be live on the 19th of November, 2019. Please look out for emails as well as announcements on LinkedIn. Our next user group meeting is at the University of Pennsylvania School of Medicine. This is on the 15th of October, and the registration link is down below. And we invite all of you to come visit our booth at the 2020 Biophysical Society meeting, which will be in San Diego in February of next year. The link is down below. And finally, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. We'll be taking questions, but before we do so, I'd like to leave you with this one quotation from Theo Swedberg, delivered as part of his Nobel lecture, where he says that in the context of AUC, the limit of the possible has not yet been reached. Thank you very much, everyone. Ross, over to you. Thank you, Akash, for your great presentation on in-depth operation of the modern AUC. We will now start the live Q&A portion of this webinar. As a reminder, submit questions by clicking on the Ask a Question box located on the far left of your screen. Let's get started with the first question. So, Akash, how do I safely handle biohazardous materials like viral vectors in the AUC? Okay, great question. Uh, this is something that several of our um, customers have been working with. So the first thing is that uh, you can order an AUC which is fitted with a HEPA filter. This is very useful because that makes sure that viral vectors will not be atomized and released into the lab. Now, there are various other protocols, but essentially, if you're working with brand new equipment, um, which is well maintained, you should not have a leak at all. And if you do, then the cleanup procedures for this are well documented. There are a few CDC documents which uh, you can look up. There are a few protocols. Essentially, just clean everything and you're good to go. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question is around the cell assembly, uh, where the question is asked is, how difficult is it to assemble the multiple components of the cell assembly? Okay, so yeah, so AUC is literally a technique with several moving parts, right? Uh, the cell assembly is not difficult at all. It uh, is a fairly straightforward technique, and all it takes is a little bit of practice. And if you're working with well-maintained and new equipment, and you've just you've had a little bit of practice, you will have perfect cell assemblies which never leak and give you exceptional data. Okay, great. Uh, the next question is how do I select the best wavelength for detection? The best wavelength. Uh, all right, so for this, what we suggest you do is before you conduct the experiment, put your sample in a UV spec 
or a nano drop or whatever other instrument you would like to and record the UV spectrum. And if you do so, you will see which of, what, what are the peaks which you might be interested in. Typically, if you're working with a protein nucleic acid combination, uh, the, the tyrosine tryptophan side chains will, of course, have a peak at 280 nanometers. Any nucleic acid will have a major peak at 260 nanometers. Uh, the protein itself, even if it doesn't have a whole lot of tyrosines and tryptophan, and therefore doesn't have a peak at 280, the peptide bonds will have a peak at 220, 230 nanometers. You can go down there as well. If you're working with uh, anything which has a fluorescent tag attached to it, Typical fluorophores of the Alexa family or uh, FITC, for example, will absorb at uh, 490 nanometers. So just put it on a UV spec and you'll immediately know what wavelength you want to detect that. And remember, with the Optima AUC, it's a multi-wavelength instrument. So you're not restricted to just uh, detecting at one wavelength. You can go up to 20. All right, sounds good. Uh, the next question we have is, are there situations in which the RPM or the speed can actually be too high? Yes, there are situations when that can be the case. If you're working with, um, say, viral vectors or large nanoparticles, anything with sediments really fast, and you've jacked the speed up to the point where you barely have uh, 10 scans before everything sediments, then you don't have a whole lot of data. I and mean, you can still process 10 scans, but in order to have reproducibility, you would like to have more scans than that. Uh, this is where the simulation tools in uh, SedFit and UltraScan both come in handy. You can uh, predict what your actual data will look like before you ever plan and uh, actually perform the experiment. Okay, thank you. Uh, the next question we have is, uh, is the AUC currently being used in CGMP environments in biopharma? Okay, so the AUC is currently used in a GMP environment by several of our clients, and uh, they have their own in-house SOPs to make that happen. We are aware that um, certain um, improvements or modifications have to be made in order to make the instrument fully GMP compliant, and we are moving in that direction. And uh, which actually brings me to an important point, that uh, while providing feedback for this webinar, or uh, just by emailing us directly using our contact information, if you have suggestions which will help make the instrument GMP compliant for your specific uh, application area or workflow, please let us know. These will be very useful to us moving forward. Okay, the next question we have is more forward-looking and asks, what are you seeing as current trends and applications most benefiting from the AUC? So, um, AUC has, okay, so let's answer this question in two parts, right? So AUC has always been sort of a Swiss army knife in biophysics, and this is the way it has been uh, treated and understood by the academic research community. Uh, it's, it's something which answers questions connected to binding constants, aggregation, uh, molecular shape, a whole number of other things. In fact, it gives you more information than usually an entire lab full of other biophysics techniques. Uh, however, in the industry context, the AC has seen a renaissance in the last few years, and it's now seeing enormous applications in areas ranging from gene therapy and especially AAV. Um, uh, preparations. It's also uh, extremely useful in looking at uh, therapeutic vesicles, such as therapeutic liposomes, therapeutic exosomes, and of course it's very, very useful in looking at uh, nanoparticles, which is also very interesting in the therapeutic context these days. Okay, thank you. So it looks like we're starting to run a little short on time, so I'll ask you one more question before we wrap up. Uh, and that question is, uh, for interacting system, how do you decide on the concentration of the component? Okay, so if for an interacting system, how do you decide on the concentration? Uh, so I'm assuming that you're talking about a system where uh, you really want to find out the KD of interaction between um, uh, component A and component B. So if you want to do that kind of experiment, ideally you would uh, look at an entire decade's worth of concentration differences. So if you're looking at protein systems, then you would really want to run experiments which go um, 
tenfold below the expected KD and above as well, if you can. And uh, in doing so, you will take the advantage of multi-wavelength detection and uh, try detecting at 280 nanometers to 20 nanometers when the concentration is really low, and just try to span um, plus or minus the KD an entire decade. Okay, thank you, Akash. Uh, do you have any final comments to leave with our audience? Uh, AC is an extremely powerful technique. It's uh, really a Swiss Army knife, and the limits of what you can do are only limited by you know your own imagination. So if you've got an AC experiment that you want to talk to us about, or if you've got an application idea where you think you need support, feel free to reach out to me and Ross, and we'll be happy to help you get started. All right, Akash, thank you again for taking the time to discuss the operation of the Optima AEC. I'd like to also, again, thank LabRoots and our sponsor, Beckman Culture Life Sciences. Before we go, I'd like to finally thank the audience for joining us today and participating. Questions we did not have time for today and those submitted during the on-demand period will be addressed by the speaker via the contact information provided at the time of registration. When the webinar recording is available for replay, you will receive an email from LabRoots and I encourage you to share that recording with any colleagues who may have missed today's live event. I hope to see you again at our upcoming webinars and events, and until then, take care.